Virgil's Aeneid is our uh, subject this morning. Uh, we have uh, passed on in a, not just the course, but in terms of chronology from the Greek period of literature to the Roman period. So it's a, an era of literature. It's also an era of uh, rule and influence. Uh, the Roman period succeeds that of the Greeks in, uh, in many ways, but it's, it's clear to say that uh, this work that we're going to look at this morning by a Latin or Roman author by the name of Virgil um, is, although it's an imitator of Homer, he is not really a true rival. Uh, because there are no real rivals to Homer. Uh, Virgil's Aeneid, we will see, and I will uh, suggest to you in many ways, uh, is drawing upon Homer's two great epics. And he has read them, and he's consciously imitating him. And imitation, as we all know, is the sincerest form of flattery. And that does not diminish in any way Virgil's accomplishments as, a, as an artist. And one of the things that uh, I, is beneficial in looking at literature in the way we do here at Tyndale uh, is to refute the common belief that in order for uh, an artist to be great, he must be original. To have no forebears, there's no grounds for comparison. He is excellent unto himself. And so everyone is striving for uh, authenticity in our day, wanting to live a, a life that's an authentic life, but they, what they mean by that is an original one, one that has no comparison to anyone else, which is quite frankly an idolatrous thought, but it's a common one in our day, and it comes from, uh, I believe, um, the ideas of artists, writers of the early 19th century by the name of the Romantics. We'll get to those writers next semester. But, um, and the Romantics, just to uh, say a little bit on that, the Romantics, it wasn't a reference to their, uh, the subject of their poetry. It wasn't about romantic love. Uh, it was about a creative perspective. Uh, and it's a, there's a, a, a seismic shift that takes place in that same period, and we are living in the consequences of that. But Virgil's uh, Aeneid um, is comparable to Homer's two works, uh, one of which we read, the Odyssey, the other which I only mentioned, the Iliad. But uh, there are also significant differences. Well, the, but the similarity is that they're both epics. And I'm going to talk about some of the marks of the epic uh, in a few minutes. It would help if we could come in on time. Um, the marks of the epic um, are consistent, because what, this is one of the things that we're going to observe throughout uh, generations, not just generations, millennia, is that there are, uh, the epic is not just a, a word that refers to something great or long or a long narrative, which is one of the definitions that you'll read of the epic. It's a long narrative poem, which is true. But there are other features to the epic which uh, make it different than simply a long narrative poem. And we will talk about some of them. We, we already saw them in the Odyssey, but now we'll see them repeated in the Aeneid, and so we will start to see a pattern emerging. And it's a pattern that later uh, epic authors will also follow. So one of them, and I will point it out to you right here at the outset, is the very introduction of it. And in, in Latin, is it says, Arma virumque cano. I sing of arms and of a man, says Virgil. His fate had made him fugitive. He was the first to journey from the coasts of Troy as far as Italy and the Lavinian shores. Across the lands and waters he was battered beneath the violence of high ones for the savage Juno's unforgetting anger. And many sufferings were his in war until he brought a city into being and carried in his gods to Latium. From, the, from this have come the Latin race, the lords of Alba and the ramparts of high Rome. And then Virgil writes, tell me the reason 
muse. What was the wound to her divinity? So hurting her that she, the queen of gods, compelled a man remarkable for goodness to endure so many crises, meet so many trials. Can such resentment hold the minds of gods? So he begins with something that we saw in the very in the last epic of Homer, namely this feature of epics, the invocation of the muse. Now it's common in, in many forms of ancient literature to invoke the muse uh, when telling one's tale. What was the muse? And why, does, why did one invoke the muse in such instances? Do you know what the, what the muse was or who the muses were? Anyone know? I don't expect you to know, but I'm curious. Sure. The muses were a set of um, gods that represented the arts. There was a different muse for each kind of art. One for the epic, one for the poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, did I say that in class? I can't remember. Or you just knew that. Um, I knew that before. Good. I think you did say that. I also said it. OK, good. I can't recall whether I said it or not. There were nine muses. These were daughters of Zeus. And they were figures of inspiration. And as you said, or as I said, um, there were muses dedicated to a particular category of poetry. So there was one for the epic. There was also one for history, by the way. Cleo. Um, the, these muses, and, and with that, something emerges that only emerges uh, in retrospect, and, and this is established in the Hellenistic age that falls between Homer's time and Virgil's an era in which the various types of literature are categorized and the various features are delineated. And so when one wants to write an epic, you appeal not only to that muse, but you also follow the epic conventions that Homer has laid down, because that will mark it out as an excellent epic. So excellence is marked not only by the man Homer, but by the style and features in which he wrote his great work. And those will include things such as style, but they will also include conventions like the invocation of the muse. But there will also be something called epic diction. Now this is the choice of words. Among the choices of words will be the form in which it's written. Now this, it's a poem. This is a translation. It doesn't capture all of the poetry of the Greek. It can't possibly do that. Poetry is almost impossible to translate. Uh, but it is written in dactylic hexameter. I won't go bother going into that here. I, uh, in practical criticism, in second year English, we go get into the various types of meter um, and uh, what their features are, wh when they're used, why they're used, etc. But just suffice to say, dactylic hexameter is the meter with which this is written. When uh, Virgil writes his poem in dactylic hexameter, he's following Homer's precedent, who also wrote in dactylic hexameter. Most of us have never even heard of meter, unless we've heard of Shakespeare and iambic pentameter. That might be. But otherwise, that's about it. You mean there's something other than iambic pentameter? Yes. There is. And this is it. So he writes in dactylic hexameter, the very meter with which uh, Homer wrote his poem. And he also uses epic similes, these long comparisons using like or as that add color to the narrative. Features. So this is about the epic language, and these become common features. Other writers, not just Virgil, but later writers, we're going to come to uh, Dante. We'll also briefly look at Ovid, although we won't have the time to go into that. But uh, Dante will write in a, a certain type of language. He will invoke the muse. He will also um, have a hero. So there's a hero. In this case, the hero is Aeneas. In the Il Iliad, it was Achilles. In the Odyssey, it was Odysseus. So that's the importance of a, of a single individual. That's an interesting in and of itself. It says something about uh, 
the worth of an individual, if you think about it. There's a lot of people here. Each individual here is important. These particular individuals are being singled out for something about them that is so, but it's something about the human individuals being stated as of importance. Not, not, not all cultures will agree to this, by the way. Some emphasize the collective. Communist countries emphasize the collective and not the individual. The individual is of no value. So we can already see things emerging here which are, are marks of uh, the epic, but in this case also marks of Western literature. An epic hero. Uh, fourthly, and I haven't got to it right here, but I'll come to it in two seconds, there is a council of the gods. Right at the outset. Right at the outset, the gods come in, and the gods not only have a council, that is, they have a meeting, they discuss what's happening on Earth, and they decide what they're going to do. They're troubled by something. In this case, Virgil flags it up right away. Who is furious? Juno. Why is she angry? He asks the muse to tell that. And then the muse goes on to tell that. And, and we can take this, oh, by the way, so the reason the muse is invoked, a divine figure, is because the story that is going to be told transcends the capacity of a human being to tell for the purposes with which he wants to tell it. And in this case, remember Homer was the teacher of all the Greeks. It's to instruct the Romans in something extremely important about their history and about their identity. So I'll just add to that. So an epic is encyclopedic. Covers all sorts of things. It talks about the gods. talks about what's happened uh, historically. Events that have transpired that influence the present day and the future, for that matter. And it also talks about what happens beneath our feet in the underworld. So it's in, it covers all those things. It's not just telling an event in history. It's saying that there's a connection between the will of the gods and what happens in the afterlife. So that's a feature of the epic. Again, most long narrative poems don't talk about heaven and hell or the, the gods and the underworld, but epics do. So it's, a comprehensive, in, it's comprehensive in scope. Um, I'm just listing these here. Uh, another feature, and this is l noted by the Latin uh, critic Horace, is that it begins in medias res, which means in the middle of things. And this narrative here will to some degree, um, which I have on the right, or yes, you're right, on the right um, of the whiteboard here. This is the narrative structure of the poem. It begins with uh, the Trojan War, uh, the fall of Troy already being anticipated, and the wanderings then of Aeneas and the tragedy of Dido that ensues and so forth. And it, but you can see there's a trajectory here and a parallelism between what happens in books 1 to 6 and what happens in books 7 to 12. Now this, was writ this was noted by a critic whose name I have put down there on the board. The other thing I would say here which is worthy of note is that Homer's epic took 24 books. Right, The Odyssey was 24, the Iliad was 24, Virgil writes in 12. Furthermore, the very first line, I sing of arms and of a man, arma virumque cano. He invokes the two epics of uh, Homer in his one epic. Arma, reference to the wars, reference to the Iliad. The man, a reference to the Odyssey, which was focused on the man. It was more about the man there, and the other was more about the wars. So in the very first line, he's, he's tipping his hat to, but at the same time invoking, and to some degree, suggesting a superiority of his poem to those of 
that of Homer. Now, I just said at the outset, uh, there are no real rivals to Homer, and, and in one sense, there isn't. Because by imitating, you're suggesting that it is worthy of imitation and not just, I'm going to ignore it altogether. Right? So as soon as you do that, as soon as you imitate, you recognize the greatness of what goes before, and therefore you're imitating it, and he does it quite consciously. But this becomes a feature of the epic hereafter. From Virgil onwards, there's a, a, an attempt, I think, to outdo previous epics. Homer's subject matter was nothing other than two important Greek princes, their heroic deeds. The individuals were uh, of significance. Virgil's is not only, it's not about two Greek princes, it's about the, found, it's about the foundation of the Roman Empire, and the empire is far greater than Greece. Greece has now fallen. Its deeds will not last Virgil believes that Rome is a everlasting city. Yes. Move over. Well, I'm saying it out as well. Uh, so, no. <laughs> I won't do it again. So, there you go. Got it? You're welcome. Yeah, that's the problem with these. Actually, I should have put it on that. I'll do that next time so I can move it around. I actually don't usually write this much on the board either. And in this, the attempt, attempt to outdo previous epics, this has something to do with the whole uh, nature of uh, the forward-looking nature of Virgil's epic. Homer, to some degree, is talking about the past and events of the past, and there's a very fatalistic sense in uh the Greek epic, which we also saw in the tragedy, right? Everything's faded by the gods. And there's no circumventing that. And there's a sense of uh, loss. There was a greatness in the past, and that greatness has been lost. And we're telling the great stories of great men that were in the past, but such great men no longer live. Virgil is doing something similar. He's talking about a man in the past whose name was Aeneas. And he was a great man, and there are no more men like him. But what he founded has lasted, namely the Roman Empire. And so his story isn't about the greatness of a man only. It's also about the greatness of what that man did. And what that man did is set himself and his ambitions aside for the glory of Rome. Rather than pursuing his own glory and his own desires and his own ambitions, like Ach Achilles did and Odysseus did, he, out of a sense of piety, and here's I need to use this word, piety, he set aside his selfish ambitions. He did it for the sake of posterity, for those who would follow him. And this becomes a Roman virtue par excellence. Patria et pietas, for the fatherland and for piety, for the glory of Rome. Because out of Aeneas' own loins will come a little boy whose name is from which we get the word Eulus is his son's name, who will thereafter be Julius, and you might have heard of one of the Roman emperors whose name was this, Julius Caesar. He was from, he, he traced his lineage back to this boy. And the emperor for whom he is writing this epic, his name is Octavian. He was adopted by Julius Caesar as his son and passed on the name. So uh, Augustus Caesar, Augustus the Good, Augustus the Great, claimed to, by, by adoption, to be connected to this man Aeneas. So it goes all the way from the past event to the present event, and the present event, this political significance there is that, I'm going to erase something here because I, I've run out of room on the whiteboard. 
the, his, the contemporary event, the political event, is something called the Pax Romana. I'll, I have limited space left, so I'll use it. The Pax Romana. Now, what is this? Have you heard the phrase before? Peace of Rome. What are the what is the Roman means of peace? You defeat all your enemies through war. That's the peace of Rome. Under Augustus, there had been a, a battle between his rivals after Julius Caesar was slaughtered. And there were three. A tri- three, three men, a triumvirate who ruled for a time and then eventually they fought it out between them and now only one is remaining and that is this man, Augustus Caesar and he's brought peace to the Roman Empire. He's put down all of his enemies and he declares his, uh, himself to be emperor and we move from the age of, and if you're in, into your Star Wars, uh, we move from the age of a, a republic to the age of empire and the empire comes with it with a time of peace. Now this is concurrent, by the way, if you're interested, and I think you will be, with uh, the onset of Jesus Christ in the days of Caesar Augustus. So while Rome is declaring peace through military rule, at the same time the Prince of Peace is entering the world and bringing a different sort of peace a different sort of kingdom, an everlasting kingdom. And the the claims of Christ are almost directly contrary to those claimed by Augustus Caesar, the king of kings and lord of lords. So that in itself is also interesting. And I'm not looking at the the Christian uh, biblical account here in this course. This is a a story, a history of uh, Western literature, and it, it, it... uh, doesn't deal with the Bible. I, that's for other classes, and I assume that's being done well, and I leave that to the experts in that. But just in a sense of timeline, this is being written while the events of the New Testament are transpiring. So that's interesting as well, I think, for you. Other thing I want you to note here, so I said the very first line uh, hints or tips its hat to the Iliad and the Odyssey right arm of Irumke Kano, of arms and a man I sing. But we also note that the first six books are very much like the Odyssey. And in those six books, Aeneas is going away from Troy, which has fallen, and he is wandering, just like like Odysseus. He did that for 20 years, remember? Or 10 years of wandering, at least. 10 years of battle, 10 years of wandering. But Aeneas here is like Odysseus in the sense that he's wandering. After he goes down to the underworld and emerges out of it, he then ta- there are seven, the, the rest of the six books are like the Iliad because it's a battle to uh, overcome the indigenous peoples of Italy. And so he becomes like Achilles. Also in terms of his character, he changes from these six books, a very... Uh, a man who is blown about by all sorts of passions to being coming out and and being resolute in his heroic conduct. I am going to do this. I'm committed to this. So we'll, we'll notice a transformation in in uh, the character of Aeneas. All of this I put on the screen uh, simply to demonstrate to you that this is a very carefully crafted book. Very carefully crafted, and it uses the Homer's epics as a model for him. There's other features. This one right here, eight, the journey to the underworld, since you can't see it because it's behind me. I'll just say, there it is. Book six, journey to the underworld. This is a, an epic feature here, thereafter. Remember that Odysseus also went down to the underworld and came up. So will Aeneas. So will in, in Dante, Dante himself will go down to the inferno. In Milton, we will find ourselves in hell in the underworld. Going to the underworld is a, a feature of epics. Epic heroes go down to the underworld and they come back up. It's not something mortal men can do. Yes? Is there a correlation to like book three and then book 11 and book four and book 10? Is that why you no, the C, the, the, the C here, book three, corresponds to the C here in book 11. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's, no, that's right. 
Yeah. Well, maybe I've just not written it very clearly on the board. E is 9, D is 10, C is 11, B is 12. Have I got that right? There's also an A, B, C, D up top is what I'm saying, like for book 1, 2, 3, 4. On my page? Sorry? Am I missing something? I think he's asking, is there like, is this supposed to be like sort of like a pattern? Yeah, it's a pattern. It's a chiasmus. In biblical, like, it's, there's a... Book 1 corresponds to book 12, 2 to 11, 3 to 10, 4 to 9, 5 to, right, and so on. And at the center, right, so that's it. And thematically, there's also correspondences and, and, and so forth. So it's not only that the one deals with the wanderings and the second half deals with the wars, and therefore it's like the Odyssey and the Iliad, there's also parallelism between the books. So this is a very artistic book. And that reflects the culture of Rome as opposed to Greece. Now, Gre the Greek epic probably originally was an oral epic. It was sung in halls. It was recited. It, but it wasn't written down. It was written down later. It wasn't written down originally. It was memorized. And there were men who spent their lives learning Homer, and they would learn him memorize the whole of the epic and sing it. And they're not reading from it. They're singing it aloud. And, but now we've moved into a literary culture. And this is written down, and that's a different. It has a different sort of effect. There's a civilization here now that has a permanence that comes with the writing down of uh, the word. Yes. Why would he? So your question, why would he write something that Homer's already written? Well, he, he, it's similar and different. His hero isn't, is a different hero. The outcome of what he does is different. He founds the Roman Empire, whereas the others didn't. Why is he? Because he wants us to compare and contrast. That's why. In sports, uh, when you have a great whatever sport you choose, baseball player, hockey player, whatever. How do you assess that guy's greatness? Well, you can compare him to his contemporaries. Sure. Well, he's the, okay, but that one's easy. He's, he's the top. But how does he compare historically? And then they compare him to somebody else. That's the measure of greatness. But you have to have a measure. It's a, greatness, excellence is not an absolute. It exists on its own. It's something that you see by comparison to others. And it, it, then you include foregoing generations. This is the problem in uh, our day, and this is not just a Christian problem, but although it, it has blighted the Christian community as well, we think that the church started with the latest missional movement, whatever it is, the latest fad for church planting or whatever, like, as if uh, the church was not a historic as well as a contemporary phenomenon. Right? And so we don't read what foregoing authors wrote, we don't uh, engage in what they, because they're struggling with things that we're also struggling and we can benefit from their wisdom so they can almost be our contemporaries you know how did they deal with that um, that's what Homer is doing and and the idea behind it which is almost revolutionary to us is they think that everything that is good and beautiful and true has already been said and it's worth holding on to you can hear that in uh, Samwise Gamgee in that, The Lord of the Rings, right? There's something good in the world and it's worth fighting for. Yeah, but it's already there. You don't have to create it. It already exists. We don't have to manufacture it. Whereas Saruman does what? He, want, he has a mind of metal. He, he is not satisfied with the way that things are. He has to break it down, tear it apart, recreate it, invent it. This is in uh, Tolkien's rendering, a diabolical action. It doesn't acknowledge the goodness of things as they have been given, have, as they've been created. Christians should be very warm to this idea because it reflects the goodness of God. This is, this is as uh, relevant as anything you'll study, even though it's written 2,000 years ago. For that very reason, it speaks to those very issues. 
what's the right view of the environment? Is it to return to a green earth with no people on it, where their carbon footprints have been wiped out, and then that's returning nature back to its original state where it'll be happy? That's not a Christian view. I've heard Christians articulate it, but that's not how it was in the Garden of Eden. They were told to exercise dominion over it, to cultivate it, to make the garden into a cultured garden, hence agriculture, etc. It's a good thing. They were told to do that before the fall, right? Not after the fall. Yes, sir. Because our father is assuming that we're Christians is uh, creative, the creator, shouldn't we, if we're in his image, also be creative? And 100%. And the new song that's sung, sung in heaven is of Moses and of the Lamb. Hmm. That's what they sing in heaven. I'm just referring you to Book of Revelation. They sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. I, I, the new song is not an original song and never have been written before song. It is a renewed song of a renewed creation. The new heaven and the new earth is not one in which the old thing is just burnt up and tossed away. It's creation healed, restored, renewed. That's what is meant by new. What about old things have passed away, all things become new? <laughs> yeah, they become the old order has passed away. Sin and death and those things that are marked that are a mark of this created order, they are passing away. When Christ returns, there will be a, a restoration of original goodness, and it will be better than it ever was. But, they, but it, it, it's not that there's no resemblance to the past. It's more like renewed, you're saying, or restored. Why did Jesus take on a human body if the human body was beyond repair and it wasn't worth holding on to? He took on a human body. It's a, it's a basic theological point. God decided to become man, even though man was the source of the fall. So you would say, let's cross that out and let's start over, and it has no resemblance. The old to the new has no resemblance. This is going to affect your theological readings, how you understand the old to the New Testaments, all these things. I'm just disputing the idea that new means original and having no relation to the past. I think that is precisely why God, why God reveals himself in Scripture through history and gradually, because the old is a template for how we are to understand the new. I'll, give, I'll say more about this when I look at Ovid and compare it to Genesis. I'll save that for our after Thanksgiving lecture. I want to deal with uh, Virgil's Aeneid today. Yes? No, I was about to ask, like, I don't, there's this uh, writer that I read, Northrop Fry, where he talks about similar ideas. Northrop Fry, yes. Like Great Canadian critic. Yeah. I heard him once before he died. He talks about, like, same thing, but he considers like a, a creative is actually like it's a creative quality if they attempt to like as you said like create something new would you say that as well it's like blasphemy even to try and uh, outdo or to regard yourself as a creator is to set yourself a, up as a rival to god so the claim uh, i'll just say this in terms of historical uh etymology the the Etymology is the study of the roots of, of words, the study of where words come from. So the words we use in English, like etymology, but other words, actually have Latin or Greek roots. So what's the word that's within the word? That, so it's going back. The word um, creator related to the artist is a, a creative writing, which everybody wants to do these days. I want to learn to be a creative writer doesn't exist before the late 19th century. How come? Is Virgil not a creative writer? Is that, are, are there, they would say no. Why? Because it's blasphemous. There's only one creator. We, we might, and, and what he does is genuinely creative. So if we want to be creative, we have to follow his template. And we can't deviate from it either. Otherwise, it's the opposite of creative. It's destructive. It might be new, but if it's new, then it's deviated from the pattern of goodness, which God has called good. 
right? So you've deviated from a yes is genuinely new and it is creative in one sense, in the sense that it's all your own. Well, good for you. But guess what? That means that it's, it's invariably and wholly wrong. If it's new, it's wrong. Because there is nothing new under the sun. You're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you. I'm not referring to you, by the way. Like the Beatles. I mean, yeah, they even claim to be God, basically. Like, oh, we're, we're way more popular than Jesus and all that. But they did create something new. Yes. That's never been heard. Did they create the musical scale? Did the harmonies that the Beatles used, did they not get them from um, Negro spiritual songs from the 40s and 50s? The answer is yes. So they were imitating already songs that existed and they just, okay, they added some, t but they're doing more or less what I've, I'm saying. They're using things that are already there, existing themes, the musical notes, the instruments they play, all of these things are not really new. The claim that they make is outrageous. And yet there is something new about it in the sense that it, it, it it's, it's, okay, it ha there's a sound there and, they're, and they're, they are individuals, so their voices are distinct. You hear John Lennon, he, can, he has a very distinct voice. Same with many of the best singers. They, you hear his voice, they, oh, I can spot that voice anywhere, right? You name the voice that you like and you, you really can pick it out. But they sing the same notes. You can have a, another person trying to sing like that person. They sound a lot like them and that person gets paid well then because now you sound like Elvis or John Lennon, right? But in general, we, it's the thing that's distinctive that we, and, and unique, and yet it's not, the claim to total originality is just nonsense. Yeah, but you're right, they said we're bigger than Jesus. Well, it's, it's ridiculous and blasphemous, but it's too silly to be, I, I think it's too silly to be, be considered blasphemous. I just laugh out loud, which is the better way to deal with it than to be outraged. Okay, whatever, sure, all right. We'll see in, in 50 years after all of the people who lived in your generation have died out whether people are on board with you or whether you, what you've created will go on the ash heap of history like so many before you. Because that they stand, good works stand the test of time. It's too early to judge the Beatles. I'm not saying pronouncing my judgment on the Beatles, by the way. I'm just saying it's really early to make those sorts of uh, judgments. But that, but that brings me to the uh, other thing about Virgil, which I want to say here, because unlike Homer, who was, for all of his influence on Virgil, was not much read in the Western world until the Renaissance period. Apologies. I hate that. I hate it when it happens. When other people do it, so my, I do apologize. Um, unlike... Homer, who was not read, his works were lost, probably because uh, it might be because of Islam, because of the rise of Islam and the overcoming uh, of, uh, but I'm speculating on this, of the East, of Eastern Christendom, which was largely Greek, and, and the works of, that were written in Greek were lost to the Western world for centuries until the Islam and Christianity encountered one another, and then they Passed, passed over again. But Homer was not influential historically on the church, whereas Virgil was. Virgil was read for millennia. Every student who was educated would have read Virgil. What you're reading now would have been read by millions historically. In, and, and why was that? Well, there were two reasons. One, and I will come to this, and we'll look at it ourselves later on, he wrote a poem before this called the Eclogues, in which it, he appears to prophesy the coming of Christ. And the church, so that he was attributed prophetic powers. He prophesied th this, and it sounds very much like the book of Isaiah. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a few classes. So that's the one reason why he was read so widely in the church, that he was held to have some sort of prophetic powers, and therefore there was truth, truth in this. It was quasi-Christian. But the second reason is because the language of the church was Latin. Everybody who was educated, no matter where they were from, read 
Latin. The Bible was written in Latin. It was translated into Latin by Jerome. The educated conversed in Latin, whether they came from North Africa like Augustine, or from Britain or France or Germany or whatever, those places where they had their own native languages, but when they, when they met together, they conversed in Latin. And so that was the language of the educated. You would converse in Latin. And Virgil's Latin was held to be exemplary. It was a source of grammar. They would look at Virgil's Aeneid and teach school children how to write in good Latin. So this is a vastly influential cultural text for that reason, even in the Christian era. So it didn't stop being influential when Rome fell and was conquered from the north by the Gauls. That didn't stop. It continued in its influence. Um, I'm going to suggest to you, uh, comments or questions at this point? Did you have a question or is it already gone? Yes, there is. I already suggest. I already. I think I mentioned it already, which is mimesis. It's imitation. <coughs> I, mimesis refers to the representation of reality. I talked about it in Plato's cave. He he, he accused the uh, poets of misrepresenting what they were imitating. What they ought to be imitating are the forms, the form of the good, the form of the just, etc. That that's what you ought to be imitating, and instead you're imitating instances of justice where, actu which, where actually we see injustice. This is terrible. But it's still representation, right? And, and the good representations have certain features which we're going to want to imitate again. So imitating earlier work, this is just called mimesis. And it reigns as the artistic model, I think, to this very day. And the claim of originality, which emerges in the 18th century and, and holds to this day, when most people talk about creative, they, talk, they mean original by that. That's, that's a late comer on the scene. And I think it's going down hard right in our generation. But it fits well with the idea of a commercial culture in which things uh, are new, like this cell phone. This was new a few years ago, and a few years from now it'll be a brick. But it was original at the time, and it was new, and the new things are better than the old things. Right? We believe that new things are better than old things. Not they. They did not think that. They thought the old things were best, and we need to hold on to them, and preserve them, and pass them down. Because truth is truth, and goodness is, good, is goodness, and, and our nature is no different than our forebears. We have the same human nature. If they held it to be good, we ought to hold it to be good. We ought to be guided by their wisdom and not trust in our own understanding. Don't think that we're wholly original, that we are the people who are the most inclusive, tolerant, wonderful, easy to get along with. Gosh, you listen to Canadians talk about themselves and think, yeah, you haven't never left Canada even. Well, you know, arrogance. It's extraordinary. My arrogance on this, I went to Europe and I was so arrogant that I thought I spoke English without an accent. I remember telling a few British people that they had a, a, a Brit an English accent. They looked at me and said, what are you talking about? Because of course they thought I had a Canadian accent. And I was offended that I had a Canadian, like mine was just the local, not the the real English. Now, I, it wasn't that I was really saying that the English didn't speak English well. It was just that they had an accent. In other words, they spoke differently than me. But I didn't have an accent. That was my point. So, and, and why did I think that? Because I had no grounds of comparison. I lived here, and I hadn't gone anywhere else, and I thought that my accent was like the actors in Hollywood, many of whom come from Canada. So. They sound a lot like me. They don't have an American, Southern American twang or whatever, right? Those regional accents. If you go to England, you will find that everyone has a regional accent. Anyway, um, I think this is it. So what you've just described and that shift is so profound, it affects uh, 
church doctrine and church practice, not just literature. That's why I think this course is so important. Um, but but the piety of, Vin of Vinius, or the pietas, let's use the Latin word here, his pietas reflects exactly this, because he is called pious Aeneas repeatedly. It's a refrain in the Aeneid. And what is the grounds of his piety? Well, what do we mean by piety? Well, let me ask you what you think of when you hear the word piety. What do you think about? If anything, is it a word even used in the Christian community anymore? It used to be. What If a, somebody said to be a pious person, what would you say? Reverence for God. Reverence for God, for sure. Yes. Do their devotionals. They read their scriptures, they pray, they live a certain godly life, whatever. He described um, Odysseus as, or, he, or maybe in the book itself he was described as pious, because he was always doing sacrifices. In the, in the Odyssey it was. He was, called, right, he was called pious because he never forgot the gods. He always acknowledged the gods. Right, so he had, there was a piety there. Okay, but in Virgil it's more than that. Although he was that, he was pious towards the gods. That's one of his distinguishing features, but that's not the only one. He was also pious towards his father, who he carried on his back out of the burning city of Rome. And more than that, he was pious towards his, heart, his household gods. Like, have you ever seen the movie Gladiator? You know, he's right. So he's carrying those little figurines, and it's really important. And in fact, this, you'll see the scene here in book two. He forgets the household gods. They're burning in, in, in the city of Troy. He runs back to get them. I think, you know, you can make some other figurines, man. <laughs> They're just figurines. No, these are part of his devotional. They, they represent his ancestors. So for those of you who are from the Chinese background, ancestral worship, it goes on in, in um, Latin culture as well. You revere your forebears. When I say revere, you worship them. He carries his household gods with him, so there's a reverence there for others outside of himself, and chiefly those who have not yet come to exist, and chiefly the glory of Rome. The glory of Rome that doesn't even exist when he leaves there. But he puts his whole life to the uh, dedication of something that does not yet exist. So it's future looking. That's his piety. But it's rever in reverence for the gods and men, his forefathers, and even those who are yet to come. So he considers others ahead of himself. That's the grounds of his piety. He's famous for this piety. Yes? He does a little bit. A little bit there. There's an aspect of that in that. But I would say that even in Christian context, piety used to entail a reverence for our forebears in the faith. Not just Jesus, but a reverence for those who called themselves by the name of Christians who passed on the faith to us. No, of course it doesn't. Because they worship Jesus, but you followed their example and you thought there was something to follow. Contemporary Christian culture is impious. That's my charge. Because they don't revere, they have no uh, the consideration of those who are older in the faith, not only those in older in generations, those who are in your churches that you're ignoring in the back seats, but those who lived in previous generations. <coughs> Remember that church is a historic entity. It's the work, the church is the people who have the Holy Spirit. And they, that church now exists, so there are two aspects to the church. There are those who once lived but are no longer with us. They, they are the church triumphant. They're now with church. They have now passed into glory. <coughs> but they're still the church. And then there's those who are our contemporaries. This will be what we call the church militant. Many people don't even want to use that word because, oh, the church military? It means that they're, on, they're under siege. There's a war going on. They're being fought. There's a fight, and the fight's coming to us. For those who are pacifists, suck it up. You're in a battle whether you like it or not. right? I'm not saying you have to fight in the physical sense, but there, there's a war you are being warred upon. 
and those people who are passed into glory are as much the church as you are the church. They're not, they were the church, they remain the church because all God's people remain God's people because he's the living God and he, they live and reign with him. Right? Right? And to be piety is to acknowledge their presence. Doesn't mean you have to be ruled by them, but you acknowledge them. Anyway, that's part of, I, I just say that because Virgil's piety is so foreign to today which is influenced so much by the Enlightenment and this idea of originality and newness, this cult of newness. <coughs> um, so having said all of that, let me erase this, if I can. Where is it? Here it is. This work is uh, an extraordinary work and it needs to be seen on various levels. Having said all that, one is the straightforward praise of Augustus. So it is a, a poem which Augustus Caesar, who is uh, Virgil's friend, commissioned. Could you write, a, we live in the age of the peace of Rome. This is the greatest age that has ever been. It's uh, It's... A golden age. Let me talk about this. This is a ancient view of history. There's a golden age, a silver age, a bronze age, and an iron age. And the one gives way to the other. The golden age was when the gods existed and there was no war. That age we know very little about because uh, in this age, which is the age of Saturn and the rule of Saturn, we know little about it because his son Jupiter rebelled against his father, brought down the golden age and began the war of the gods. So the rebellion of Jupiter against Saturn brought in turn a rebellion of the earth gods, the Titans against the sky gods, Jupiter and company, right? The Olympus, gods of Olympus, the sky gods fi fighting against the earth gods, right? The, the, uh, that's told in Hesiod, if you want to read that, Theogony. That was the Silver Age, the War of the Gods. The Bronze Age, there should be a Z in there, is the age in which we're discussing here when there are men and gods, and there are godlike men. There are men who are born of divine blood, like Aeneas himself, like Achilles, like Odysseus. They have a Greek, they have one parent who's a, a man and another parent who's a god. That's the Bronze Age. The Aeneid is telling us events that took in ancient history and they were done by demigods. And Aeneas is one of them. He can die, but otherwise he, he achieves deeds that no man can achieve. As I say, he goes to the underworld and comes back up, just like Odysseus does. This is not possible for mortal men. That was in the Bronze Age. Now, however, we're in the Iron Age. This is the age of men. And it's each successive age gets worse and worse. This is marked by conflict and pure conflict and military might and, and greed and sin and famine and war and such forth. That's what's happening in the Iron Age. But with the onset of the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, there's a claim being made by Octavius or Caesar Augustus that we are entering a golden age and he is the God who's bringing it about and this poem is to announce that it began back in the age of, of Aeneas and now it's come to fruition so that we're in a we're in a, a period in history when we're returning to a golden age yeah that, that's the historical sense of the Greeks and the Romans It's a cyclical thing the eternal recurrence, Nietzsche speaks of it as well. There's a pattern of history, and guess what? It doesn't, it doesn't stop. Now, Virgil puts a specific stamp on it, however. He suggests that actually it may, this golden age may persist. That's there in the, in the text. There's a sense that this golden age, uh, this age of peace under Rome, may be different than the others.
in the end of all this, Aeneas will become a god. He'll become a star in the firmament. By the way, it's not described in the story, but it's referred to elsewhere that Aeneas himself will become divinized and become a star to be worshipped. Not told in the story. Um, that's one level on which you can read this, but there's another level on which you can read this, which is that, it, and it's almost directly opposed to it, that the idea of a golden age is a m myth and can't possibly be true. And to explain why that is, we need to know a little bit more about Virgil himself. Virgil is a Stoic. Now the Stoics, if you've read Acts 17, were a group of philosophers that uh, came into existence after Plato, one of the schools of philosophy, the Stoa. And the Stoics were renowned for certain things. One of them was the maintenance of the public good. So Stoics were always involved in politics. They saw the public good and the preservation of the public good as a, as a sacred duty, more or less. So Stoics were heavily involved in government, unlike the Cynics, who lived like dogs and lay on the ground and didn't want to preserve human culture. A lot of Christians are cynics these days. You know, they don't cut their hair and they look like they just stepped out of bed and so forth and they look disgraceful. It's like nothing exalting, nothing noble in the human form. That's that it's a, the cynical posture really, that there's nothing beautiful about the human body, there's no attempt to. Uh, honor the body through the way they treat themselves. But the Stoics were different than this. They, they um, sought to preserve the public good, but they didn't reg regard bodily, the bodily nature of humanity as their true nature. Their true nature was their spirit, and so there was a mind-body dualism there, which is characteristic of the, of the ancient world. Actually, all of the schools of philosophy held to this, that the spirit the spirit or the soul, maybe we should put the soul in there. The spirit or the soul is the essence of the human being. And the body was something that was like a prison house for the soul. Because the soul was more closely allied with the reason, like that Plato would have held to this as well. Whereas the body was connected with the passions or as we would say it, although it has slightly different connotations, the emotions. And to be driven by your emotions or your passions was, is a wretched s state of affairs. You're acting like the animals. They can't think. They can't guide themselves. They just react. They don't think about anything. They can't govern themselves. You need to be governing yourselves. Your soul needs to govern your body and you need to basically bring your body into submission to your reason. That's how the Stoics thought. And so Stoics are known to this day for, uh, be, for suffering and not being expressive of their emotions. They're controlling that, the passions. This is why they're in favor of the public good, by the way, because they know in a state of civil war or anarchy, they're gonna, there's going to be a lot of emotional turmoil, and they want uh, internal peace at all costs. So the contemporary appeal to mindfulness and inner peace, which is just a form of Buddhism, which is baptized on the West Coast and passed around to the North American educational system as if it were a new thing, is like a Stoic ideal. There's an inner tranquility, which is the preservation of the good of the soul and a detachment from the body. That's the Stoic belief. And that's because when they go down to the underworld, their body is gone and they are, after a thousand years they're reincarnated and put in another body. By the way, that was Plato's own view. Plato believed in reincarnation. Because the soul perdures. The body, which is not the real him, that will burn off, that will be punished, whatever, but then it'll be reborn. We'll see the exact same thing in Virgil. 
But this is the essence of his, himself, his soul. So Virgil in the Aeneid will repeatedly talk about the problem of giving in to the passions. And he will describe it all over the place. But books one through six are a description of Aeneas as a passionate man who gives in to his passions. He has an affair with Dido, He's, uh, who's the queen of Carthage, the enemy of Rome. He's almost deflected from his calling, which is to found a, an eternal city. He's going to stick. He's going to stay in North Africa because he loves this woman Dido, and he's not going to do what he is fated to do, which is to go on to establish Rome. He's moved by his passions rather than his duty. His mind is being overruled by his passions. So there's a potential tragedy there. Fate might be thwarted by this man Aeneas. So he's not a very admirable character in books one to six. The question is, because when he emerges from the underworld, he now has a mission to ground Rome and he goes about it resolutely. The question is, is he still a slave to his passions when he does that? Well, we'll have to look at books seven to 12 to figure out whether he's got, he has mastered his passions and I'll, I'll give it away, he doesn't. And his rival, Turnus, actually seems morally superior to Aeneas himself. But that's just a subjective observation on my part. Uh, when I come to uh, book uh, six in two classes, the underworld, we will see that he emerges from this underworld and he goes through a gate which suggests that this idea of a golden age was just a dream and not truth. So Virgil himself undermines his own story of the golden age being brought about through arms and military means. For Virgil, the Stoic, it's you can't conquer the true problem of human nature, which is that your passions run wild by war, where passions run wild. That's not how you do it. It has to be through an inner tranquility. That's it. So I say Virgil promotes mindfulness. Not quite. But that that sort, the, it, uh, the Stoic, he doesn't think that war will ever pass away. And as long as that is the case, the golden age cannot come about. That can't come about. So it will, we may have a golden age now, but guess yet what, Augustus? It won't be long before there'll be a war within the ranks of Rome, and we'll go back down into this. And that is actually what happens. Rome does not last. There are internal, there's corruption within and so forth, and eventually barbarian invasions and Rome is conquered, etc. And Augustine has to meditate on that fact in the city of God. Yes? Biblically, like we see what Daniel, the Daniel interpreting the dreams. Yes, and four so beasts he sees. One of them is Rome, probably. One of them is Greece. One's yeah. You know, yeah, not only that one, but like the king tells him the dream about seeing like a statue with the golden head. Golden head. Silver body, and then he goes low, and then clay, clay feet. feet. Mm -hmm. Where does Rome stand in that? Like, because that is kingdoms, right? Well, that's really, so the uh, whole idea of biblical views of history is really interesting. And that's one of the passages that will be used to talk about a view of history. Daniel, which is highly prophetic, particularly after book seven, it gets into apocalyptic, right? Uh, but it does seem to be talking about ages. And, you know, is, that, is he talking about the gold and the silver, the bronze, the iron age there, but he has feet of clay among, so, so this is the addition there, is that in all of those ages, the, the statue has clay feet, and that's what brings it down. That's not part of this picture. There's no clay in these ages, yeah. right? But that is the portrait of Daniel. Does Daniel know about ancient mythology? And these, I suspect he does, because remember, he's in Babylon. He's learned their mythologies. So here's the addition to the image. All of these ages are brought down by sin which is what feet of clay becomes uh, a symbol of, really, in English. Right? So he's talking about historiography. Yeah, yeah, there's an age, and then there's an X, and there's an X. And the, but in the end, they all, all of them have feet of clay, and they all come down to naught. And there's only one uh, ruler of history, and that's God. Right? So yeah, you're right. I, th I think he is referring to that. So Virgil, I think, is a pacifist, though. 
uh, and his 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 portrait of the peace of Rome brought about and the grounding of Rome, which happened through uh, military means, is further undermined by one final thing. Who is the goddess that chiefly concerns himself with the Romans? Venus, goddess of love, passion. The Romans are a passionate people. Their goddess emphasized, like, how can they, she favors them because of this. They, they're marked by it. Well, how can they avoid the, the very thing which Virgil the Stoic wants them to, to get beyond? They can't. So I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's faded that the Romans not be able to establish the Golden Age, at least for a man like Virgil, who's a pacifist and a Stoic. At the same time, he's going to do his best to keep the peace of Rome. He doesn't think it will ultimately succeed, but it's a good thing to try to. And so um, we will get this, the, this outbreak of furor, rage, passionate, breaking out throughout the poem. And his uh, narrative of the coming peace is uh, radically uh, undermined by that. So but, uh, going back to what I said about the Council of the Gods, let me get to the Council of the Gods because I haven't even got far into the epic, but I, it, I never do in this first class because I have too much uh, background material to bring to it. And I haven't even got to the context of the historical context, but I think I referred to it at least a little bit. Um, and, but I, I can direct you to other sources if you want. But I left off in book or line ni 18. Let's go to 19. So he invokes the muse, and then the muse starts speaking. And what does the muse say? There was an ancient city they called Carthage, North Africa, where Augustine was. Rome's ancient rival, by the way. So as he's telling it, there have been three Punic Wars that have been fought, P-U-N-I-C, against Carthage. And the at issue was who is going to be the ruling power over the Mediterranean. Will it be Rome or will it be Carthage? Three wars are fought. By the way, the, it, it looks like the Carthaginians might be the superior. They have a great general by the name of Hannibal. He comes across the Pyrenees, uh, or the, the Alps, in, on elephants. They've never seen elephants. Terrifying. Great general. What are, the Ro what are the Romans good at? The Romans are good at enduring. They give land for time, and they let him exhaust himself. And they keep getting defeated, and they keep getting defeated, and they keep getting defeated. But in the end, they wear him down and burn him out, and they defeat him. Anyway, but that lies in the background that, that there's this city that's called Carthage, another city, not just Rome, not just Troy, an ancient city they called Carthage, a colony of refuges from Tyre, off the coast of Israel, by the way, ancient traders, a city facing Italy, but far away from Tiber's mouth, which is on the west side of Italy, extremely rich, and when it came to waging war, most fierce. This land was Juno's favorite, it is said, more dear than her own Samos. Here she kept her chariot and armor. So this is how it came about. There was a battle amongst the gods. So Carthage favored, was favored by Juno. And she knew that in the battle that was to come for supremacy between Rome and Carthage, that the Romans were going to put her favored Carthaginians down. And she was angry about it. So it's a battle amongst the gods, which leads to a battle amongst the men. But here she kept her chariot and armor. Even then, the goddess had this hope and tender plan for Carthage to become the capital of nations. If the fates would just consent, Virgil throws in, and the fates don't consent. You can't change the fates. but. So it's almost a humorous aside. If the fates would only consent, that was her plan. For Carthage to become the capital of nations, 
But she had heard that from the blood of Troy, a race had come that someday would destroy the citadels of Tyre. From it, a people would spring, wide ruling kings, men proud in battle and destined to annihilate her Libya. The fates had so decreed. And Saturn's daughter, in fear of this, remembering the old war that she had long since carried on at Troy for her beloved Argos, <coughs> and indeed the causes of her bitterness, her sharp and savage hurt, had not yet left her spirit. For deep within her mind lies stored the judgment of Paris and the wrong done to her scorned beauty. The breed she hated, what's the wrong done to her scorned beauty? <coughs> Paris was asked to judge between the three goddesses, Juno, Athena, and Aphrodite, or Venus, which of the three is most beautiful? And the three goddesses bribe him. So it's a contest. You're a mortal man, you come along, you just happen to run across three goddesses. Oh, that's great. They say, which one of us is most beautiful? The one offers him power, Juno. The other offers him wisdom and so forth, Athena. The third, Aphrodite, offers him all of his lusts to be satisfied. I'll give you the most beautiful woman in the world. Paris decides on the woman. That's, her name is, uh, um, what's her name? Sorry? No, no. Who's that? Helen of Troy. Helen. Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world. So Paris runs off with Helen, takes her back to Troy, and that launches the Greek War. <laughs> but she, Juno is still angry that she was not judged to be the most beautiful. She's still angry about that. Say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, or a goddess for that matter. But she's still angry about that. And, and the war that went on, it's still burning in her spirit. And so the gods themselves are, are subject to the passions. This is not a good thing <coughs> in Virgil's mind. But she, said she hates the breed of men uh, and honors that had been given ravished Ganymede was angered even more. For this she kept far off from Ladium, the Trojan remnant left by the Greeks and pitiless Achilles. So she's kept the Romans from landing in Italy. That's how it begins. The story begins with Juno opposing the Trojans in the same way that we saw that uh, Poseidon opposed the Greeks, and specifically Odysseus. So the gods are preventing them from their fate. <coughs> and then we begin with a council of the gods. Uh, a council of the god comes in all that. But the, but the gods are initiating the conflict here and lie behind it, which is why I said at the outset, Juno is there, and then there's a storm which she causes. And the storm uh, will eventually get appease and there will be a reconciliation in the end but there's a long way but that but the god the battle and the war amongst the gods lies in the background for all the other uh, material to the story there's a heavenly war going on as it were three goddesses one of them whose nose is out of joint and she's going to take it out on the romans and there she can't but she can't stop it because it's been faded so the gods are not particularly powerful in the sense that they can't determine outcomes. But anyway, that's the view of gods in the ancient world, um, which is very different than that of uh, Judaism and Christianity, where God is held to be supreme and one, and there are no other gods. And he ordains all events. He creates the world. He's good in his nature. There's no uh, nothing immoral about his nature, etc. It's a very, very different portrait of the gods or God, as the case may be. But I will come back to that next time. I am going to look a little bit here about the fall of Troy and, and very little about the wanderings of Aeneas. I'm going to focus on the tragedy of Dido. So read book four, and uh, that will be the main focus for our uh, class next time. Okay.